Timothy 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teaching of demons, through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irrelevant, silly myths. Rather, train yourselves for godliness, for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, for to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them, so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing you will save both yourself and your hearers. Chapter 3 ended with a discussion of the goodness of God. Now, the reason it is important for us to know the message of God and His goodness and display that truth to the world is because, is because there's going to be deviations from that message. We need to behave like the people of God and uphold His truth because people will depart the faith. Now, we saw Paul describe two who had shipwrecked their faith back in chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. People are going to leave the faith. They're going to follow deceitful and demonic teachings. It is a sad picture that is given that people are going to leave the faith and that there are going to be people teaching false things. I think it's important for us to see in chapter 4 here that Paul is telling us that there will always be false teachers, not caring that they are deceiving people. This means that each of us have a responsibility. We cannot accept what is being taught simply because of the person who's teaching it. You do not need to accept what I'm teaching because I'm teaching it to you. 
You must never depend upon a teacher. Instead, depend upon the Word of God itself. You need to see it in God's Word and believe it because it is God's Word. It is so important because there are false teachers, and there will always be false teachers. So the only way for you to know that you are supporting and proclaiming the truth to the world is to not rely on me or any other teacher or preacher, but rest your faith on God's Word. This is one of the many reasons why I want you to open your Bibles with me and study the Word of God and read it and see it for yourself in black and white. This way, your hope is not on me or through me, but it rests exclusively on the Word of God. And you can see the text for yourself. Paul goes on to list some of the false things that were being taught at that time. Some were forbidding marriage for Christians. Notice that Paul says this is a false teacher. You are not holier or closer to God because you chose not to marry. Being single is not a holier life. Holiness is not tied up to your marital status. Now, some were teaching that they needed to not eat certain foods. Somehow, this was a greater holiness because you did not eat certain foods. Paul tells us that this is not how we are to look at life. We are not to condemn what God has created. Food is not sinful. Marriage is not sinful. Sex is not sinful. Money is not sinful. The internet and television are not sinful. Technology and smartphones are not sinful. It is how we use these things that can be sinful. We are not holier than another by abstaining from these things. I've seen Christians on social media sort of look down their noses at others because, hey, we don't watch TV in our house. We, we, we got rid of the TV because of all the sinful stuff there. And yes, I agree with the sentiment. There are sinful stuff. There's also good stuff. Again, the TV itself is not sinful. It's how you use it. Not everyone is at the same page that you're on. Don't try to create spirituality by removing things from your life. So how should we look at life? Notice that Paul says that what God created should be received with thanksgiving, verse 3. God made all foods and all things received with thanksgiving. Food is a wonderful gift from God. God did not have to make food taste good or make our energy in life come from eating, but he did. And we are to enjoy what he has made with thanksgiving. Marriage is a wonderful gift from God. God did not have to create marriage for us, but he did. And we are to enjoy what he has made and receive it with thanksgiving. This is the point of verses 4 and 5. Everything God created is good and is not to be rejected if received with thanksgiving. Think about what Paul is saying. Life is good. One of the false teachings that would begin to gain traction toward the end of the first century was something called Gnosticism. One of the branches of Gnosticism declared that everything created was evil and material existence is flawed. This has led to the kind of thinking that suggests that enjoying life in this world is a bad thing. And you can see this taken to some extremes in some religions, even inflicting pain on yourself as a mode of spirituality. The idea is that the flesh is inherently evil as well as everything created. But here's the Apostle Paul teaching that that is simply not true. Food is to be enjoyed. Marriage is to be enjoyed. In fact, everything created by God is good and is to be enjoyed. The whole point is that whatever we have is given to us by God, and we are to be thankful for it rather than avoid it or resent it. Whether it is food or money, whether it's work or rest or vacation, what God wants us to realize is that these things are from Him, and He created it so that we would be thankful to Him. When we get in a car, it is a gift from God, and He should be thanked. We get to go on vacation or travel. It is a gift from God, and he should be thanked. When we get more wealth, it is a gift from God, and he should be thanked. When we get rest, it is a gift from God, and he should be thanked. May we never look at what God has made and suggest that there is something evil or sinful about it. God has gifted us so much for our use. This becomes a very important faith foundation for our consideration. Can I thank God for what I am doing, or am I ashamed for what I am doing? I think that helps us know how we are doing with the gifts that God has given to us. If we do something, use something, or have something, 
Are we able to thank God for what we did or received? Or does our conscience condemn us and we are ashamed because we have taken something that is to be received with thanksgiving and used it for sin? Now, one more consideration here. Am I focused on God who gives me blessings to enjoy or am I just focused on the blessings? The other misuse is that we care more about what God has created than God himself. We get caught up in our cars, our wealth, our careers, our travel, and our technology, so much so that we lose our love for God. So we must ask ourselves if we have lost our love for God because our hearts have been entangled by the blessings given to us. Notice again what Paul says in verse 6. He says, If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. This is an excellent summary of what Paul is doing in this letter. Timothy is to teach people these faith foundations that Paul is declaring. Listening to what Paul is saying is the training in the words of faith and in the good doctrine that we need to follow. These teachings will be nourishing to our faith. Paul concludes chapter 4 by talking about cross-training. But he's not talking about the cross-training that has become very popular in our exercise programs over the past few years. Paul has in mind spiritual cross-training. Paul tells Timothy to train himself for godliness. Paul reminds us to not participate in myths and endless speculations, which he first warned about back in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 4. This is an important reminder. There are so many false things and so many wastes of time in various teachings. There are some teaching pursuits that simply hold no value, yet people want to offer endless speculations. For example, God has not decided to explain to us exactly how everything works with our eternal spirit when we die. He's not given a bunch of details about what our spirits are doing as we wait the final return of Christ. But there are certain endless speculations about what will happen and what it all looks like. In the same way, there are endless speculations about the end times. To make teaching platforms and ride these speculations where God did not clearly reveal is not training ourselves in godliness. What God did say is limited. Paul told the Corinthians that when Christ returns, then comes the end. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 23 and 24. Even later in the same chapter, the Corinthians were asking how the resurrection of the body is going to work. Paul does not give details. We will be raised, he says, in glory and bear the image of the man of heaven. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 39 and 43. Now, I want us to see that Paul has a concern that we are not wasting our time in things that do not have answers nor help in our faith. Remember that our goal, as stated back in chapter 1 and verse 5, is love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Paul sarcastically insults these waste-of-time teachings as irrelevant, silly, and myths. Cross-training does not waste time with empty teachings. But we need to see that cross-training is the most important thing we can do in this life. Just look at verse 8 here. In verse 8, the Apostle Paul notes that bodily training has some value. But godliness has value in every way. I have always joked that 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 8 is my favorite verse in the Bible. Godly training is of some value. Uh, I like the New King James Version better. Bodily exercise profits little. But godliness has value in every way. Godliness is useful for all life. This is such an important truth for us to hear. The most important training you can do in your life is devote yourself to God. Godly training has value in this life and also in the life to come. Cross training realizes that our souls are the most important exercise we need to do. Think about your spiritual training. Think about training our souls. How much exercise is our soul receiving? I remember several years ago, there was a bodily training exercise routine that swept the nation called P90X. Do you remember this? I never tried it, right? It sounded too painful to me. Never looked into it, but I'm sure you did hear of it. Think about the kind of training and exercise our souls need. What are we doing to strengthen our souls? Too often our spiritual exercise amounts only to the sermon on Sunday morning. 
Maybe our spiritual exercise amounts to only three hours a week. Imagine what would happen to your physical body if you never moved except for one hour a week. Or what if you never moved except for three hours a week? What would happen to your body? We would destroy our bodies. In the same way, rare spiritual training is a disaster for our souls. Paul wants us to make a comparison to physical training. We understand that physical training is helpful to our bodies. But Paul says it has limited benefits. But the training of godliness is beneficial in every way. We need to work out our faith. We need to exercise our souls. This is an important truth for us to realize and believe. Verse 9. But that does take work. Paul notes that in verse 10. Paul says we are working and laboring because we have our hopes set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people. We train our souls and exercise our faith because our hope is not on our physical bodies. Our hope is not in this life or in this world. Our hope is not in our health. Our hope is in the living God. The point is, is that cross-training is worth our effort. So what are some of the areas where we need to spiritual cross-train? Paul has described many areas throughout this letter already, but he will carefully consider some important cross-training areas in the rest of this chapter. In verse 12, Paul tells us to cross-train by setting an example. Paul tells Timothy to not let anyone despise his youth. I think it's important to notice that Paul does not tell other people to not despise Timothy's youth. Rather, Paul tells Timothy to make sure that no one despises him because of his age. Now, how would he do this? Timothy is not going to do this by telling people not to despise him. Hey, y'all stop despising me. Y'all to stop doing that. No, Timothy will do this by setting an example in his speech, in his lifestyle, in love, in faith, and in purity. Cross-training means thinking about your life as a way to be spiritual examples to others. When you speak and when you act, think about the kind of example this shows for others. This is a powerful tool to consider for cross-training. Let's start small and work our way out. First, set an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity in your home. The way you talk should be an example in the home. The way you act should be an example in your home. Your love, faith, and purity are to be examples put before everyone else in your home. How different would we act and talk if we use this cross-training habit? Secondly, set an example in speech and conduct and love and faith and in purity in the church. The way you talk should be an example to the church. The way you act should be an example to the church. Your love, faith, and purity are to be examples to all believers. How different would we act and talk to each other if we use the cross-training habit? Finally, set an example in speech and conduct and love and faith and purity in the world. The way you talk and act should be an example to your neighbors, your co-workers, strangers, friends, everyone else who sees you. This is the cross-training habit Paul gives to Timothy. It's an example for others to see. Live your life to an example, not a cautionary tale. In verse 13, Paul also tells Timothy to devote himself to the scriptures. Sometimes when we think about devoting ourselves to the scriptures, we can only think of personal Bible study time. Personal Bible study time is important and critical. That's why we're doing these videos. But there is so much more that is needed. Verse 13, Paul is referring to the public declaration of scriptures. This is why most translations add the words public, so that we do not think that reading refers to reading the scriptures to yourself. Devote yourself to the public reading of the scriptures, to the preaching and the teaching. We live in a time that really emphasizes doing things at home by yourself. I want us to see that this is not what God had in mind for our faith. Cross-training is not independent or isolated. The scriptures are always declaring the necessity of coming together so that the word of God can be publicly read and publicly taught. We saw this earlier in the letter and it comes out again here. Worship is not an at-home activity. Worship is an activity requiring participation together. Devote yourself to the teaching. Devote yourself to the public reading of the scriptures. Learn from God through the public proclamation of the word. 
I think it's apparent here in verse 14 that Timothy had a special situation. A prophecy had been made about him, and he understood his calling from that prophecy. The council of elders had laid hands on Timothy to devote him to that calling and that gift. Paul tells him to not neglect the gift that he has. While we have not been granted miraculous spiritual gifts today, because we have, in fact, the complete and inspired Word of God, this does not mean that we do not have abilities and gifts that God has given for us to use. All of us are built differently and have different capabilities in what we are able to do for the Lord. We must not neglect the gifts that we have. We must not think that there is nothing we can do for the Lord. Further, it is important to remember that there is not just one gift in the body. The Apostle Paul reminds the Christians in Rome and in Corinth that we are one body, but have many members who do not have the same function. Romans 12, verse 4, and also you can read that further in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 through 20. This body needs so many different areas of talent and ability. And when we studied chapter 3 last time, we saw the call made that we need men who will prepare themselves to shepherd in the church. We made the call that we need men and women to prepare themselves to be the servants of the church. We need people who will be encouragers. We need people who will be generous. We need people who will show mercy. We need people who will lead. We need people who will teach. We need people who will reach out to the world. No one person can be everything. We do not have all of these abilities, nor do we have enough time to do them all. But each part is to do its share. Paul told Timothy to not neglect what he's been called to do. Cross-training understands that we have a work that we can do. Don't neglect doing it. Finally, 1 Timothy 4 ends with an appeal to watch your life closely. Paul says in verse 15 that cross-training is all about practice. We understand this about physical training and physical activities. I cannot expect to be good at golfing if I only do it one time every three years, which is about my average. I cannot expect to be a good fisherman if I only go once in my life, which is kind of also my average. No one is good at anything the first time that they do it. No one stays good at anything if they only do it occasionally. Spiritual cross-training is about practicing and immersing ourselves in spiritual things. Look at your life closely and evaluate it. Watch your life in speech, in conduct, in faith, in love, and in purity. Why is it so important to closely evaluate yourself spiritually? Well, just look at how verse 16 ends. Paul says, Persist in this, for by so doing you will save both yourself and your hearers. The only way we will save ourselves from spiritual disaster is doing this constant evaluation and godliness and practicing those things. But this is not only for your own good. This is also for the spiritual welfare of those who we teach and live our lives of faith before. Stay in the Word of God and devote yourself to godliness for your own spiritual wealth and for the spiritual health of others. Spiritual cross-training has benefits for everyone else in your life. Your influence, your teaching, your conduct, your faith, and your love can have a dramatic impact on the lives of others. Devote yourself to cross-training. Remember, cross-training avoids silly teachings that only promote endless speculations. Cross-training sets examples for others. Cross-training does not neglect our gift, but uses our gifts. Cross-training is all about practice, practice, and more practice in godliness. That concludes chapter 4. Next time, 1 Timothy chapter 5. Thank you so much. Have a great and wonderful day. You are my